consider yourself much of an athlete, Mike? Not right now, no. <laughs> I like the honesty. Uh, I don't think of myself that way either, but maybe we just haven't found the sport for us. Well, maybe this week we can help each other out a little. Depending on where you live in the world, dear listener, you may be into sports like basketball or soccer. I think you mean football. You know, like the one where they actually hit the ball with their feet. Uh, sure. Football. Let's move on from this, I think, before we go into a rabbit hole we don't need to. Well, I want to start with race walking, which is basically exactly what you think it is. Race walking consists of a long-distance race, typically held on either roads or on running tracks, with common distances varying from 1.8 to 62 miles. It's a big, it's a big distance <laughs> variation there. It's a big range. Big range. And you may be thinking, well, what's different about this? It's different from normal racing in that one foot must appear to be in contact with the ground at all times. Foot contact is assessed by race judges. So this doesn't actually sound like a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it is. In <laughs> fact, both a 20 and a 50 kilometer event are held during the Summer Olympics, and the first World Race Walking Cup took place way back in 1961. Of course, this sport emerged from a British culture of long-distance competitive walking known as pedestrianism. In fact, the first <laughs> known competition took place all the way back in England in 1880. Well, your country may have given the world... The great gift of race walking. But in the last 50 years or so, Russian and Chinese athletes have been among the most successful professional race walkers. Let's go back a bit and dive into some of the specific rules of race walking. The first dictates that the athlete's toes on their back foot cannot leave the ground until the heel of the front foot has touched the ground, right? So you cannot have both feet off the ground at one time, which I guess is something that happens when you're running. Uh, violation of this rule is called a loss of contact or achieving flight time. <laughs> <laughs> I really like, like that label. <laughs> the second rule, and there's only two, the second rule has to do with the athlete's legs. The supporting leg must be straightened from the point of contact with the ground and remain straight until the body passes directly over it. It's, I'm not 100% sure that people can really picture what that looks like. It's a little weird. So we've put a video in the show notes this week that explains it. Uh, but the effect basically is that race walking looks like a fast, stiff leg walking as if the leading leg at any given point is being restricted by something like a brace. I do have to say that I tried this in my backyard the other day. And it's a lot harder than I thought to keep one foot on the ground at all times. And is there a video of that in the show notes? Nope. Nope, there's ah, not. <laughs> well, I recommend people do go and watch the videos, though, because if you've never seen race walking, it's kind of a thing to behold. It's almost like a Benny Hill type sketch. It is, it's, quite, <laughs> it's quite a beautiful and weird sport. Somehow, the two rules, these two race walking rules, are enforced by judges that are stationed along the race course. Each athlete can receive three red cards for violations before being disqualified. If that happens, a judge holds out a red paddle and the race walkers event is over. For these monitoring reasons, races are held on a looped course or on a track, so judges get to see the competitor several times during a race. No judge can submit more than one card for each walker, and the chief judge may not submit any cards. It is their job only to disqualify the offending person. Now, this system can be brutal. Jane Savelle was disqualified within sight of a gold medal in front of a home mm. crowd, I would add, in the 2000 Summer Olympics. I think I've had enough of race walking. I want to I up the speed a little bit. So let's talk about juggling. What? Yes, my friend. I did not misspeak. Juggling is the competitive sport that combines juggling with jogging. Why do I feel like this is not in the Olympics? <laughs> Tragically, you are correct about that. The World Juggling Championships are held each year as one of the events at the International Jugglers Association Juggling Festival, where results are recorded and medals awarded. Anyone can compete in the World Juggling Championships, but competitors need to be able to juggle three balls proficiently and also pay a small fee. Now, is this like race walking in that it's basically what it sounds like? Pretty much. The most common objects used in juggling are juggling balls or sometimes juggling clubs, but any set of three or more objects can be used. Most jugglers prefer to use palm-sized beanbags stuffed with birdseed because it's light enough for long distances but heavy enough to withstand winds. Jugglers say that arm motions of juggling with three objects actually feels natural with the action and pace of regular jogging. Well, there you go. 
Up next, we have Zorbing. Is this some kind of space thing? Zorbing. It does sound like that. It turns out that actually, Zorbing is the sport of rolling downhill inside an orb generally made of transparent plastic. (laughs) I think we're stretching the definition of a sport. (laughs) Zorbing is generally performed on a gentle slope, but can also be done on a level surface, permitting more rider control. In the absence of hills, some, some people live where it's flat, some operators have constructed inflatable wooden or metal metal ramps. Due to the buoyant nature of these orbs, zorbing can also be carried out on water, provided the orb is inflated properly and sealed once the rider is inside. The orb itself is double sectioned, with one ball inside the other with an air layer in between. This allows the orb to absorb bumps whilst traveling. They are lightweight, they're made of like a flexible plastic as opposed to the rigid plastic, for example, like you would find in a hamster ball. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's a great... <laughs> Looks a lot like it, but made of a different material. It really does. Many models have straps inside to keep the participant safely in place during the event, while others leave the rider free to walk about the orb uh, or to be tossed about freely by the rolling motion. A typical orb is about three meters in diameter with an inner size of two meters. The inner and outer orbs are often connected by numerous, sometimes hundreds, of small nylon strings. Zorbing, or quote, hill riding is performed at commercial locations where prospective riders pay a fee for each ride or for a whole day's activity. And I looked it up, Mike. There's one about three hours away from me, and I'm kind of thinking about going to do it. I think we should do it together. It sounds like a lot of fun. (laughs) I think we should. Things can go wrong. Uh, In January 2013, at a ski resort in Russia, a man died from a broken neck, and another was seriously injured when the Zorb they were in rolled out of control down a mountain. Oh, my. I will say, like, of course, it's terrible him i bet he got a real rush beforehand though i mean that thing going down a mountain that's that's gonna get your adrenaline up i think there i'm just gonna move right on (laughs) there are a few world records we should mention longest distance traveled in a single roll is held by steve camp who traveled 1870 feet in the zorb that feels like a record up for the taking the fastest zorb was clocked at 52 kilometers an hour which is 32 miles an hour with keith culver inside that sounds terrifying (laughs) (laughs) so out of these three weird sports mike which one would you want to do most i think zorbing honestly because i can't juggle and i have literally no interest in a race that i need to perform with my legs like i don't want to race walk i don't want to run Uh, i don't want to jog or juggle so zorbing i've actually seen like i've seen this before like i've seen pictures and video of this thing before and i think that it looks Like a lot of fun, albeit a little bit dangerous. Maybe I would like to do one of those ones where you're strapped in and you're just rolling, you know? I don't like the idea of running around in there like a hamster. (laughs) I agree. I think out of the three, definitely sounds like the one I want to try. Uh, Maybe a little bit dangerous, but sounds like a lot of fun. So we have Walter to thank for sending in joggling as a topic, which set us off on this weird uh, search for other strange sports on Wikipedia. If you have a topic idea, uh, you can get in touch uh, you can do so at relay.fm slash ungeniused. Links this week, including that video that you should go watch about race walking, is at relay.fm slash ungeniused slash 26 or in the podcast app of your choice. Uh, like I said, you can get in touch. You can send us a topic. A lot of these topics come from you, and it's always fun to explore new corners of Wikipedia. So, Mike, until our next word article, say goodbye. Goodbye. Adios.